Good morning, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm coming at you right after our snow day, yet another snow day. This one came with some really nice photos. Pardon the music in the background, but from that gym there, I took this awesome shot this morning. Check it out. I wanted to start this class off with some photography themed news. So first bell ringer question for you is in this upcoming video, describe the technique that this guy uses to take a picture of a pinwheel galaxy. Bell ringer question number one, describe the technique that this guy uses to take a high quality picture of a pinwheel galaxy. I took a picture of a galaxy that lies 21 million light years away through my telescope, this telescope. Say hello to Messier 101. This spiral galaxy is located near the handle of the Big Dipper in the night sky. This is a three hour exposure to record as much light as possible. This galaxy is nearly twice the size of our own Milky Way galaxy and is estimated to contain over one trillion stars. So that galaxy is over 20 million miles away. And I hope you caught on to the idea that he's using an exposure technique. The idea that you don't have to take a quick snapshot. You can actually hold the camera, or in this case, the telescope in one spot for several hours for a longer period of time. And that gives you a higher quality image. If you do that, you can see something with a high quality, even really far away, even 20 million miles away. And you may have noticed too, that that TikToker's name was Astro Backyard. The very concept being that he's just using a backyard telescope. So now here is what you're going to see if you use an even better telescope. Bell ringer question number two. Bell ringer question number two, what is the name of the famous picture taken with an even better telescope? than this guy's backyard telescope. Bell ringer question number two, what is the name of the famous picture from an even better telescope? Grab a book and find a word with a lowercase i. Noticing the dot of that i, now hold the book up at arm's length, still looking at that dot, if you can. Here's what's mind blowing. With a powerful enough telescope, you'd be able to see over 3000 galaxies within that tiny little region. This is what the Hubble Space Telescope did in 1995 when it pointed its lens at a completely empty, dark piece of the sky with no visible stars or anything. The telescope simply kept its shutters open for 10 full days, allowing as much light in as possible. This is the image that resulted. It's called the Hubble Deep Field and it contains within it over 3,000 spiral and irregular galaxies. Some of the galaxies in this picture are over 10 billion light years away. A few years later, astronomers repeated the process with a completely different part of the sky and got similar results. If you extrapolate these results for the entire night sky, we're led to the conclusion that the universe easily has over 100 billion galaxies. Now, I know not everybody gets sucked into this the same way I do, but still, the dot of an eye at arm's length, stretched out in the sky, just imagining that number of little dots all around me, not just in 180 degrees, but 360 degrees, all around. The entire sphere of the Earth, no matter which direction we look, seems to have the same relative concentration. So we probably do have like 100 billion galaxies in this universe. That's where this mind-blowing bit becomes interesting in terms of the news. The Hubble Space Telescope has pretty much been the best telescope we've had my entire life. 1995, 26 years ago, around Christmas time, that Hubble's deep space field picture was taken. 
26 years after, we now have the James Webb Space Telescope. So if you've been ignoring me, or just missed it, the James Webb Space Telescope launched on Christmas of 2021, very, very recently. We're now starting to get some images. We're gonna get really cool things with this because the key idea with the James Webb Space Telescope is it doesn't just see visible light that we see with our eyes, it can also see infrared light. So we can take pictures of things that we can't actually see with our normal human eyes. Also, infrared allows us to see even further back in time, even farther back in space, about 13 and a half billion years, which is crazy because the beginning of time was probably about 13.74 billion years ago. So we can almost see back to the beginning of time now because of the James Webb Space Telescope that just launched on Christmas. Bell ringer question number three. Without having to look 13 and a half billion light years away, what cool thing do we now have even better pictures of with the James Webb Space Telescope than the Hubble Space Telescope? So James Webb Space Telescope is an improvement on Hubble. From what I'm about to show you, which planet is this? Bell ringer question number three, which planet are you seeing in these James Webb Space Telescope pictures. So there's our space science news update. Now here's Sam Bentley with some good news. Bell ringer question number four is going to be, tell me at least two pieces of the good news that Sam Bentley shares. Bell ringer question number four, tell me at least two pieces of good news that Sam Bentley shares. This is a beach vacuum. Yes, a beach vacuum that sucks up microplastics and returns the sun to the beach. It was invented by a bunch of students in Canada and it's called the Hula One. Microplastics are a huge problem as they make their way into the ocean, into the marine life and if you eat fish, into your body too. Trials show that the Hula One can gobble up to 48 kilograms of microplastic in just a few hours. That's a lot of microplastic. Great work Canada. Here's some good news you might have missed. Singapore is building a forest town which will have greenery everywhere. It will prioritise walking and cycling and even have a nature corridor for wildlife. Speaking of nature corridors, this wildlife crossing in Wyoming helps pronghorns and other wildlife migrate safely and it's helped cut down wildlife vehicle collisions by 85%. Indiana is going to be home to the largest solar farm in the United States. 
it'll generate enough to power nearly a quarter of a million homes. There's now a ban on selling most ivory products in Hong Kong. This comes after a three-year process to eliminate the once rampant trade in the city described as the world's largest ivory market. And millions of oysters are helping to clean the Hudson River in New York. Oysters are amazing at filtering water and one can clean up to 50 gallons of water a day. Follow for more good news. And here's Tanetri yet again with some interesting things. Your bell ringer question, bell ringer question number five. Tell me two interesting things that Tanetri shares. Bell ringer question number five, share two interesting things from this next video. Here's today's interesting things. Check out this photographer attempting to get a bunch of F-15s together in a row for a shot. I don't know how people do this when my palms get sweaty climbing up a ladder. Seriously though, this is so cool and check out the final shot. This is a giant African snail which can grow up to 30 centimeters in length. They feed on more than 500 different types of plants including peanuts, beans, peas, cucumbers, and melons. Uh, wait a minute, excuse me, why does your rabbit have a shell? This is a time lapse of Europa and Io orbiting Jupiter captured by the Cassini Pro. This shot is honestly so unreal, I can't believe we can do this. Space just constantly fascinates me. This is an example of how a finastiscoscope works. This works because the camera records a certain amount of frames per second, and if you get the rotation speed just fast enough, this is the result. The whole thing is called the stroboscopic effect. This is a javelin throwing machine, and this person- Bell ringer question number six, number six is going to be this next video by Adorian Deck is going to have maps that change the way you see the world. Describe one of these maps. Describe one of the maps that change the way you see the world. Bowering your question number six. Maps that will change the way you see the world. This map shows GPS tracking of multiple wolf packs around a national park. It really shows how often wolves just avoid each other's territories. This map shows 20 different eagles that were tracked over a one year period. Notice how they constantly avoid water. This is a map of occupied bald eagle nests in Wisconsin in 1974 and 2019. This is how big Japan is compared to the east coast of the United States of America. 50% of all Canadians live south of that red line. These two areas of Africa have roughly the same amount of people. Each one of these sections contains 10% of the world population. These maps show the passenger railway networks as of 2020 in each of these countries. This is the longest possible way to travel by train in the entire world. Follow for more. This next one, I honestly didn't know until fairly recently, I'm embarrassed to say. So, passing this on to you guys. Bell ringer question number seven. What is the main difference between a grasshopper and a locust? Bell ringer question number seven. Describe the difference between a grasshopper and a locust. Fresh knowledge for your brain. Who wants to learn the difference between a grasshopper and a locust? It's a trick question, but it's also not a trick question. They are different. This is a grasshopper, this is a locust, but they're members of the same species. Grasshoppers turn into locusts under very specific circumstances. When resources are dwindling and grasshopper populations get forced into smaller and smaller areas, their little grasshopper bodies rub up against each other, and it triggers a special chemical in their brains that makes them go through this transformation. Their bodies get darker in color, and the peaceful, solitary grasshopper turns into the scary, swarming locust, and boy do they swarm, and boy are they scary. There are reports of locust swarms devouring the clothes off people's backs, the wool off of sheep. They're very different, but they are the same animal. And that chemical, by the way, serotonin, the hormone that makes people experience happiness. What there you have it. It's not just plants that use chemical signaling. Grasshoppers and locusts are the exact same animal, and all it takes is a little bit of chemical signaling to trigger that biological change for them. Let's do this as the last one. Bell ringer question number eight, yeah? Bell ringer question number eight is the last one. This is crazy. Tell me where Venus flytraps are from. One more time. In case you didn't already know, where are Venus flytraps from? What's a fact that just doesn't sit right with you? Don't worry, I'll go first. So we all know Venus flytraps, right? If you don't, they're plants that survive on insects and spiders that accidentally get too close. 
Fly traps have these tiny hairs that are triggers for the plant to snap shut. When a fly trap comes into contact with one of the hairs once, it's the second time it touches it that makes the fly trap decide to catch a body. And to make sure it doesn't waste its time on something that isn't food, the plant won't start digesting the fly until it touches the hairs multiple times as it tries to escape the trap. So as the fly panics and tries to escape, the trap only gets tighter and tighter until it releases juices that basically digest it in its own coffin. And since most fly traps are bright red with a ripe fruity smell, it's like walking into a McDonald's except the door's locked behind you and you get deep fried the moment you try to get out. But that's not the fact that bothers me. You'd expect to see this kind of thing in Australia or possibly Africa. Nah, cause apparently Venus fly traps are native to the subtropical wetlands of North and South Carolina.